The founding of the Free Worlds League in 2271 into the first true interstellar superpower was arguably the most significant event of the 23rd century, but around them the chaotic and erratic birth of new nations was continuing as normal. Their spinward neighbours, the Capellan hegemony, themselves founded only one year prior, were about to enter a period of growth that would in later years be referred to as the Capellan Renaissance. This was chiefly a cultural evolution that would lay the groundwork for the later Capellan state, as the hegemony began to make tentative alliances with other emerging powers in the region. However, the hegemony was an expansionist nation at heart, and they first set their sights on their immediate neighbours in the Ingersoll Concordium. A brief campaign in 2272 saw them annex this microstate in its entirety. Spurred on by this success, they next moved against the St. Ives Association the following year, further expanding their empire. By the end of the century they had established new provinces across the region, but in so doing had created problems for themselves. The Capellan hegemony was a scattershot of different planetary groups on an inner sphere map. The different provinces were accessible only by traversing other nations, which were at times hostile to them. Defending this region for the predations of others both within and without the Capellan zone became an ever more challenging task. Meanwhile, the Free Worlds League was making territorial gains of its own. In the Articles of Unification, it was outlined that each of the three provinces would be responsible for a particular aspect of government. Orient would handle diplomacy, Regulus would manage trade, and the Commonwealth would be responsible for defence. During times of war, a Captain General would be elected to temporarily control all functions of the League to help them through the conflict. The first instance of this was the war with the Stuart Confederacy, and naturally, House Marek was the clear favourite for this position. On September 19th, 2293, the Free Worlds League began a four-month campaign that would see them annihilate the Stuart dictatorship and absorb its worlds as a fourth province. How Stuart would survive to the present day, its war long forgotten, and now acting as a staunch supporter for House Marek. In the Rimwood region of the Inosphere, the independent worlds were at last beginning to form their own interplanetary states. This began with the merger of several sky-based trading conglomerates in 2296 to form the Sky Traders under the control of Ian McKeeston. Such was the power of this new group that they were able to claim de facto governorship of a group of planets near the Terran Alliance. Over the next three years they would transition from trading league to interstellar nation, and so was born the Federation of Sky in 2299. To conclude the development of the 23rd century, the Marlette Association was formed in 2278 and the Principality of Razalhag was reformed in 2299 from the old Razalhag Consortium. To kick things off in the new century, after splitting from the Sky Traders, Seth Marsden established Donegal Freights in 2301 on that selfsame planet. In due course, his trading empire would become the final of the three powers in that region of space. On the other side of the Inner Sphere, on distant New Samarkand, one family was bringing the previously opposed city-states together into a unified world government. Emerging on the scene as the Lord of Yamashiro, Shiro and his brother Yurizen were about to establish a dynasty that would survive the next 700 years of turmoil into the present day. Raised in a family with deeply traditional and martial values, the two brothers would go on to proudly wave the banner of House Kirita. The Kiritans had dreams of founding a militaristic superstate and began working towards this goal by reaching out to nearby Galadon, the major power in that region of space. Though Galadon was a successful colony, they played second fiddle to the Azawa Mercantile Association. This massive organisation dominated the entire quarter and had grown fabulously wealthy, often at the expense of the individual worlds they did business with. The planets, including both Galadon and New Samarkand, had grown dependent on the OMA, but also chafed under their influence. When Shiro Kurita arrived on Galadon in 2302, he cast the Azawas as their common enemy and proposed an alliance to help them free themselves from the control of this powerful trading family. Using well-placed flattery, Shiro suggested this new partnership would take the name the Alliance of Galadon and proposed that he would take command of a new military force to wrest control of their planets from the OMA. With the agreement in hand, he turned to other nearby planets, approaching the governments of Dnepropetrovsk and Svrdlovsk, the former willingly adding their strength to the Alliance. A hastily armed fleet of ships began to board and impound any Azawa vessels that entered the region, with each captured jump ship adding to their navy. The stolen goods were in turn used to grow the size of their military in anticipation of coming events. When the OMA realised what was happening, they began first by boycotting the worlds, but then switched to a public relations campaign that saw Kurita start to lose his grasp. Shiro was not prepared to fail now though, and in a move that shocked everyone, resulted to the terrorist bombing of all Azawa Mercantile Association facilities on the planet Galadon within a single day. 
There was little to no fallout from this, however, as over the last year he had cunningly replaced his opposition within the Galadin government, after unearthing, or perhaps fabricating, evidence of double dealing with the Azawas, replacing them in turn with loyal supporters. The Azawas were done, and though the organisation would survive for a time, they were forced to pay tribute to House Kirita. Not prepared to rest on their laurels, the brothers' next move was to launch what was at the time the largest planetary invasion in history. In 2303, 50,000 Alliance troops descended on Sverdlovsk in a show of force that utterly crushed local resistance. But the actions of the Kirita brothers were about to become an afterthought in the histories of the time. Smouldering tension in the Capellan Zone was about to see the two dominant powers clash violently. This conflict would spill over into not only the other powers of the Zone, but involve even the Free World's League and the forces of House Davian. In 2305, the Capellan hegemony finished drafting their plans for what they thought would be a preemptive strike against the San Supremacy. Their best estimates suggested a four-week campaign would bring the Sans to heel and deal with their hostile neighbour for good. The Hegemony Supremacy War holds the dubious honour of becoming the first true interstellar war, their presumed easy victory lasting not for four weeks, but for four years. The origins of the war lay with the secession of Palos and Wei from the Sun of Supremacy at the beginning of the year. Capella decided to support the independence of these two planets, and offered to help defend them when Sana came to reconquer their worlds. In February, the Hegemony launched their Doom Raid against Sana, and immediately bogged down when they met near fanatical resistance from the Sana militia. Reserves from all across the Supremacy were recalled to the capital, and this stalemate would continue through to September when the Capellans withdrew. Meanwhile, the Sans were able to retake Palos, establishing themselves as an early favourite. Things got worse in October of 2305 when the geographical dispersion of the hegemony came back to haunt them. A sharp uptick in pirate action, clandestinely hired by Sana, saw the hegemony worlds of Redfield, Daniels, Lee, Ball and Highspire all come under attack, which in turn drew military forces away from the front lines. These raids continued until reinforcements came from the neighbouring states of the Chesterton and St. Ives trading leagues. The Cluanian pirates launched an operation against Osha, but were caught recharging in the Alcyon system, where they were destroyed almost entirely in April of 2306. There was more positive news when Capellan troops were able to successfully defend Wei from the Supremacy forces, but troubling information soon came to light when it was discovered that the Cluanian pirates had been in league not just with the Sans, but the Davians too, perhaps in an attempt to further destabilise the region and expand their own influence. Seeking to forge further alliances of their own, the Hegemony approached the Free Worlds League, and in May, promptly signed the Ryerson Conventions. The League offered up fresh troops for the campaign, but these were soon found to be green and inexperienced. Meanwhile, the Captain General, Danak Salaj, began his own assault, taking control of Berenson and Wasat. The Hegemony was forced to implement oppressive legislation against their own citizens, in an effort to maintain their struggling supply line and dwindling military might. They succeeded in part when the Capellans began their final phase of the war in December 2307. By September of the following year, they had succeeded in occupying 17 of the Sana worlds. However, their alliance with the Free Worlds League had cast them as invaders as opposed to liberators of planets under the thumb of the supremacy dictatorship. Though the Capellans had been able to win the support of the semi-independent Chesterton League, the Tikhonov Grand Union remained officially neutral. This was a stance encouraged by generous donations on the part of Sana towards certain influential figures within the Union. Tikhonov had its own problems during this period. For the past four years they had been in conflict with the Marlette Association, and lost several key worlds. In November 2308 they began their counter-attack against the Marlettes. Their initial moves met with great success and by the end of the year they had retaken two of the lost Chesterton worlds. Meanwhile, the draconian measures undertaken by the Hegemony government were about to catch up to them, when in the final month of 2308, the planet Arboris declared their independence. If the Capellans allowed this to go unanswered, it would set a dangerous precedent given how unpopular the current regime had become. The second Andurian reserve fleet was promptly mobilised and moved from Zion to Arboris. En route to the planet, however, they came upon unexpected opposition in the form of the Liao merchant fleet. Arboris had been accepted as a protectorate state of the previously independent Liao. In the ensuing fleet action, the Capellans took significant damage from the technologically inferior Liao ships, and by battle's end were in a state only to maintain a blockade around the planet Liao, abandoning the assault against Arboris. By early 2309, the Tikhonov invasion of the Marlette Association was continuing at pace, but the unexpected death of the general behind the campaign saw it fizzle out after less than a year. 
This was followed by the death of one of the ruling tetrarchs of the Tikhonov Grand Union, which in turn threw the nation into disarray. On the other side of the Tsarist supremacy, the writing was on the wall for the Capellan hegemony and the ruling Aris family. The Free World's League had withdrawn from their alliance, and anti-government protests grew larger and more frequent. Their final victory came at Sakhalin in April of 2309, but soon after, the Liao blockade was lifted, and in the following month, an armistice was reached. The Tikhonov Grand Union came forward as a neutral arbiter, and by December the two sides agreed to peace. The end came on the final day of the year, when the prime magnate of the hegemony, Paula Aris, took her own life. In the aftermath of the hegemony supremacy war, there was new impetus among the nations of the Capellan Zone to unify in the face of threats without. In 2310, the hegemony was disbanded as a part of the peace agreement, and replaced with the Capellan commonality. Sick of internal strife, the major powers unified behind this banner, though each would retain internal control of their own nations. Across the sphere, Shiro Kurita was beginning the next phase of his expansion plan. By now, the Alliance of Galadang laid claim to more than a dozen worlds and had a fearsome reputation. Several neighbouring planets were also beginning to establish themselves as interstellar players around this point. Shiro began a diplomatic voyage that would see him visit many of these worlds, offering them membership in the Alliance. Promising to support them in their own territorial disputes and ambitions, Shiro was able to win the favour of all of his targeted planets. Some even joined because of his impressive military record. By the time Shiro returned to New Samarkand, the size of his realm had exploded to include around 30 planets. Unlike the other nations that were centralised around a single major world, the Alliance of Galadin was a tenuous chain of widely dispersed planets that stretched far towards the periphery. With no immediate rivals in the area, however, they were safe from attack for the time being. In early 2311, though, it became apparent to the newly joined members that Shiro would play them against each other, when Deiron and Altair both threatened each other with Galadin's support. In response, the two worlds split from the Alliance and formed the Deiron Federation. Other planets followed suit, declaring their intention to leave the Union. In response, Shiro launched a major political purge that saw roughly half of all the planetary leaders, nobles and diplomats within the Alliance of Galadin lose their lives. He then unleashed his brother Yurizen to bring the Eden worlds back in line. Benjamin would fall in late 2311, then Telos and Asgard the following year. The final days of the Terran Alliance were at hand by this point. The last of the minor nations to appear around them were the Protectorate of Donegal in 2313, which grew out of Marston's Donegal Freights, and the Duchy of Liao in 2315, having established a strong reputation for itself during the Hegemony Supremacy War. That same year also saw the final collapse of the Terran Alliance and its rebirth as the Terran Hegemony. In 75 years, the political situation had evolved to become unrecognisable to how things had been before the Outer Worlds Rebellion. Humanity was now at its most disunited with two dozen different alliances in existence. The most powerful of these was the Free Worlds League, but Director General James McKenna had grand plans for the new Terran Hegemony. His position was that the formerly independent worlds were nothing but an errant flock, to be brought back into the fold. The 25th century would see him act on these plans, which triggered a chain reaction in the politics of the neighbouring regions. By the end of the century, less than half of the two dozen interstellar nations that were around to see the birth of their Germany would remain. <laughs>